All right, so an archaeology of dragons. I guess we should probably start with why we would use those words. Um, archaeology is, is, is a story of layers, basically. It's not an X marks the spot journey. And each layer will tell you something different. So it's not really about finding the first uh, instance of something. It's about finding how something begins and how it changes through time. So in the case of the dragon, which, by the way, next term we need to get to, why I didn't use this one. Every time in the last, say, four months that I've been putting this together or working on the research, people have like, so you mean dragons like a metaphor, right? And I'm like, well, I do, because when you talk about dragons, uh, you're always talking about a metaphor. But we use the ocean as a, as a metaphor, and I'm pretty sure it's still there. So the idea of something being metaphorical or something being non-existent is, is very limited. So the idea, so we're going to go through the layers pretty much from, uh, from now, from modern day, to where I think we can find potentially the beginning of uh, the dragon story. So. That means we need to talk about the mythology of mythology. This is the, um, what you tend to hear, and it's sort of fairly unthinking, is that uh, dragons might be part of the human brain. There's some sort of universal mythology. But the reality is there are very few universal beliefs. Not even sun worship uh, is universal. So whilst something is found all over the world, that doesn't make it universal or part of the human brain, because you'll find that they're non-randomly distributed. And if something's non-randomly distributed, another factor is involved in how it moves. If dragons were part of our brain, then it would be as randomly dis distributed as eyesight. But it's not. There's, there's, it is a story or a myth theme that has been moved around through time. As I said, they're globally uh, popular and non-randomly distributed. As for why, probably not this. Uh, but we will... Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's an example of what I mean by non-randomly distributed myths. This is, and it sort of came up yesterday, the separation of heaven and earth myth, which you obviously find in Egypt. Uh, you kind of see from, I'm going to try and do it for you guys, so you kind of see a uh, southeast to uh, northwest arc. And the darker areas, for those at the back that can't see, is depth of motif. So there's about between 9 and 10 in the areas that are darker, moving up to lighter where you get less than three motifs um, per myth. So you can do this with stories uh, and start to see the shape of them. And that pretty much points you in a very good direction for where you need to go next in, in looking for myths. So that's what we're going to do. It's how we're going to calibrate the dragon. What you can, uh, once you've found an overlay of the myths, you need to look for genetics and archaeological evidence. And where all these three things overlap, you can start to think or paint a picture about what's going to happen. So in the case of dragons, when they overlap with elite or royal associations, and crucially the beginning and ending of a world, and whether or not they're good or bad, allows you to kind of calibrate a sequence of dragons. And I do mean dragon. Uh, this is important because obviously it's a very old myth and it's, it's found everywhere. It kind of touches on the idea of snakes and the ocean and other monsters and the stars and kings and what have you. But we're going to stick as close as possible to dragons. We do touch into these things because otherwise you lose too much of the signal and you end up telling a history of the world rather than an archaeology of dragons. The word itself uh, point us in the right direction. It's uh, Greek for basically giant uh, water serpent, and the original word probably comes from the verb to see clearly. It's either that or um, like a glittering. Uh, to see clearly is glittering, and that could be like scales or, or, or something underwater. But that's where the, um, the word comes from. So we're going to begin um, talking about, I guess, how history works. So we have, um, you'd, you'd recognize Mr. Carter on the back, on that side. Um, meanwhile, this guy's fucking terrifying. I, if you told me, if you told me he's still alive and maybe even in this room, I would, I would believe it. They say, yeah. But we get, we get the kind of ghosts of our macro stories from exercises like this. Because the past, or the story of the past, changes with every present. So if you think, for instance, during the Renaissance, even though they couldn't read hieroglyphs, uh, everything came from Greece and Egypt. Uh, and then we have in high Victorian times, it came from Mesopotamia and also sort of what, what was described this to me, but sort of like pre-Hindu uh, India. They, uh, the Hindus were morally corrupt, um, but a lot of stuff came from India and they got it wrong and they needed fine upstanding 
um, British soldiers to, uh, to fix it. Uh, during the Edwardian age, where you start to see uh, the likes of V. Gordon Child arbitrarily picking a time and a place that he liked in the world and saying that's when civilization began and everything before it is barbarism and everything afterwards is civilization because it looks more like London. Um, <laughs> but, uh, we kind of need to get past this. We sort of need to realize that the past is political and it's sort of our story or our job, especially as magicians, to, to own that story. That's a shamanic tribal role, to, to own the story of our bloodlines and our gods. And at the moment, too much of it has been given over to people who have had agendas that don't work with ours. Yeah, so that's an oversimplification, but what's sort of happened uh, with a diffusion, uh, which is uh, the term where okay, so an idea started somewhere in a part of the world you like, where there were white people maybe, and then moved uh, into parts of the world that you didn't like quite so much. Uh, around the 80s and 90s, with the rise of things like uh, postmodernism, it became clear that this sort of idea is kind of racist. Uh, and so the lazy solve, and it was pretty much a band-aid, the post-structuralist band-aid was, all right, fuck it. Everyone independently invented everything, no further questions. And that's the trouble. So we've gone, <laughs> we've gone from this is unhelpful to this is unhelpful, and we need to find a pendulum swing, swing somewhere in the middle. And I think the dragon is one of the best guides to doing this. Uh, because if you shine some light on the dragon story, large chunks of the history of Western esotericism sort of fall back into place, or at least recontextualize. So we're going to start going layer by layer um, from the modern day. And by the modern day, I mean Wales in 1959. Um, so we're going to start there. And I mean that. Um, we've had the dragon for 1400 years and it's still political. Um, under pressure the Queen had to, and by the way it is the best flag in the world, but the Queen had to go, yeah, only the red dragon on a green and white flag should be um, flown above government buildings in Wales. So that association of power and, and right to rule uh, is still associated with the dragon. Here of course is um, where it lives, Dina Semris. My Welsh is terrible. Um, the, the story of Ortegon's Tower is very obviously astro-theological. The, the red and the white dragons fighting every evening. But um, the first evidence of dragons appear with the Germanic invaders into Britain. And they're always associated, just like Grendel, with the right to rule, one way or the other. Um, the dragon is either a sign, you're either in control of the dragon or descended from it. And dragon stories are about right to rule. And that is particularly the case in instances of invasions because that's when the right to rule is up for grabs. This, one's, I, this is a lovely story, but it's also kind of sad. I found it in an old uh, Edwardian um, folktale book, but basically, Carmarthenshire, 1763. A dragon uh, lands on the ruins of an old Norman keep, and a local boy returned from wars in France, he wasn't just on holiday, um, snuck up the river because it was sort of breathing fire and scaring people, and shot it, and it fell into the river and sputtered and died in front of everyone, and the, it sort of slowly decayed, and the corpse um, washed out to sea. I think that's really sad, but uh, it's fascinating, I think, because if we knew that local boy's name, I bet you he was from a prominent family in the town. Because whilst we associate dragons with the likes of St. George and religion, in the UK in particular, the vast majority of British dragon stories aren't religious. They have to do with um, local prominent personalities. So again, it comes down to that um, local right to rule. St. George himself only got his dragon in the 13th century. Uh, and I've written about this on the blog, but I think the Normans chose him as a saint because at the time they were still having many problems with Wales. And so he was this foreign warrior saint who kills a dragon, and there are those damn Welsh. Um, I think that may actually feed into it. It also ties into the sense of legitimacy that you get through St. Patrick or, or anyone else. This idea of removing snakes or having a power over the dragon is, again, associated with some sort of royal legitimacy. So that's sort of moving us as we go backwards in time from 1959 through 1700. We're going to run through the Dark Ages. I think we need to look again at the Golden Legend. Um, I don't have my New York Times for the 13th century, but I'm pretty sure 
uh, it was the most popular book in Europe. Um, whilst after Gutenberg you did have local language Bibles, the, the reality is there weren't that many of them. This was local language. Everyone read this. And it is basically a Dark Age project blue book. So all the weird UFO stuff um, that Jacques Vallée talks about is in here. All the crazy stories of, of um, saints and ghosts and the Grateful Dead of Bar, all this stuff is in the Golden Legend. And that's where George gets his dragon. And also Saint Sylvester unbinding the dragon of Rome. You can't really see that, but that's what he's doing there. It's a giant stinky dragon uh, underneath Rome. Then his Christianity got rid of it. Margaret of Antioch, I like this one. Um, she was eaten by the devil when she was in prison. The devil appeared to her as a form of a dragon, but uh, it couldn't digest her crucifix, so it vomited her back up, or in some versions, exploded. Now that's a very obvious Jonah analog, which is important because if you look at uh, Hebrew and Mesopotamian dragons, there is constant blurring between whale and dragon and sea monster because, of course, if it's the Bronze Age and you're out on a boat and you see a whale, yeah. it's, it's scary as a dragon anyway. Uh, but that's quite important because we're going to see that typology of story shapes uh, moving backwards in time. Here's a horde more beasties, working backwards from the 12th century. Uh, Catalan dragon, um, drake, two legs, sometimes with cow and lion heads, poison and bre poisonous breath. Scultone, uh, Sardinian dragon, uh, kills with its gaze and is immortal. Uh, I can't do that one in Hungarian, but it's a giant dragon in human form with multiple heads. Uh, it gets weaker as each head is removed. And then a smock, which is a fire-breathing, multi-headed Slavic dragon. Now, if you know your grimoires, or if you know your Stratton Kent, um, all classics, these things should be, or these traits should be very familiar to you. And it's in kind of draconian mythology that you see some of the strongest threads of the survivals of uh, monsters and spirits that also show up in grimoires um, through the classical world, like early Dark Age and in. Uh, and perhaps more importantly, I think we get additional association with treasure um, and grimoire spirits here because not only is the dragon associated with right to rule, it's also associated with, as a result, um, bloodlines and dead kings and, and people who've come from before and they tend to be the ones buried with all their loot. This is the Grecian pivot, so now we're in um, ancient Greece. Well actually, we're mostly going to skip it um, and go to archaic Greece instead. It's dragons all the way down and um, this is Hesiod, um, so Dragons, kind of dragons, kind of dragons, dragon, um, some dragons, hydra. Uh, this is quite interesting because we have the most complete, at the very beginning of Greece, layering of uh, generations and dragons. And if something shows up at the fully formed at the beginning of a culture, it's a foreign import, um, which we'll look at in a sec. I love this. Um, it's something actually uh, Mog touched on briefly uh, yesterday morning. Composite images appear in archaic Greek art around the time of city formation. You can actually associate um, the rise of urbanization with an increase in the production of monstrous images, or composites as fancy people call them. <laughs> uh, in the 8th century BC art, uh, you'll see in Greece, it's primarily domestic. Less than 100 years later, it's fantastic. It's snakes, it's griffins, it's dragons. And the the thinking behind this, um, Dr. Uh, Wengro of UCOL, the thinking behind this is it was the established social order was disrupted by higher quality foreign goods and elite membership uh, became defined by ownership of non-Greek goods and iconography. Just like anything else, like having a, having a Bugatti, uh, it's, uh, it's a status symbol because you can either have the shitty Greek-made stuff or you can have these exotic things coming from the East and they become status symbols just like they do today. Uh, but they're ambivalent. I love this. Uh, this is David Wengrow's uh, quote. These orientalizing objects were sought after, but they were also potentially threatening. They are monsters, they are foreign, they are what have you. Uh, and you, so, for instance, in Attica, you see attempts, of, uh, attempts to incorporate monsters uh, into the existing political order to demonstrate the political order's power over them. Um, as examples, in Crete, Tauret, which is a foreign monster, becomes a, li a libation carrier in Minoan palaces. So this thing that was scary out there, it's like having an exotic pet. Uh, and in Greece, you see sphinxes and griffins arrive around this time on the mainland, and they're sort of housed in the newly ordered Megaron. So as um, the political shapes of these sort of religious political buildings uh, reform, you get foreign monsters in a position almost of not subservience, but control, like I have power over this thing. 
which is where I think his reptilians genuinely come from, because lizards were like the it bag. So uh, that, that reptile and elite association, he's correct about, but it's not because the queen is a lizard. It's because 3,000 years ago, um, dragons were the thing you had. <laughs> This is the source of the monsters, obviously. We're moving into Eurasia. Uh, that's, this is really cool. Um, this is Siberian tattooing. There's some kind of fish monster, and uh, this is awesome. Um, you also have the, the linguistics of it that show that we're looking in that Eurasian world. Um, Azi or Aziz is the Avestan word. Uh, it's related to the Sanskrit word Ahi. And apparently, um, I got this off a legitimate website, I promise. And um, these words are distantly related to the Greek Ophis or, and the Latin Anguis. So we have a uh, Indo-European word, so the Eurasian overlay of the serpent dragon came from this direction. We could kind of imply that from the location of the monsters, but this is how we move further backwards in time. Stop me if you've heard this one. Snake, apple of immortality, garden. This is Ladon, um, and it's Hesperides, which incidentally means uh, originating from the evening star. These are the Hesperides, this is their garden. Uh, it means originating from the evening star, which could, I think, be a persistence of astrotheology as well because of the devil's association with the morning slash evening star and Venus. But that uh, is right there in Greece as well. You can see the import of these Mesopotamian ideas. Going backwards, Litan Lotan uh, in Canaanite is like Ladon, and that's also where we get the word Leviathan from. So this is the actual devil. Oh, and like Rahab, which is, Rahab is weird, um, Leviathan presides over a chaotic ocean that Yahweh pacifies when he defeats it in combat. We kind of skip over those descriptions, well, um, Judeo-Christians will skip over the descriptions that are quite patently Mesopotamian Yahweh as a big god with a stick kind of thing. Uh, but I love them, I love these kind of uh, echoes. In Canaanite, uh, you, um, you get Latin, uh, which is Lotan or whatever, uh, is a seven-headed serpent uh, and um, is defeated by Baal Sapon. So that's kind of the, the Yahweh analog in that version. Ra's destruction of Apophis. I, I want to sort of touch briefly on Egypt because they had many beasties, but we're kind of, I'm looking for the archaeological layers of how the dragon ended up almost in the Western mystery tradition. And some of that came through Egypt, but we, we kind of have to jump around it. But Ra's destruction of Apophis um, is a, a similar version to this kind of destroying of the snake type. Uh, and interestingly, to, this is how we can kind of point it back into the Near East. Um, after killing Lutun, Baal Sapon moves into a very Las Vegas palace of um, gold and lapis lazuli. Uh, there's a 2000 BC Egyptian story called Tale of the Shipwreck, and a lone survivor washes up on this island that has a palace of gold and lapis lazuli, and it's ruled by this giant human-headed snake. So you can kind of see the echoes, especially when you're talking about naval um, trade, you can see the echoes of these stories bouncing around in the Near East. Humbaba, uh, a giant guarding the cedar forest where the gods dwell, head of a lion, tail and penis of a snake. Um, he's decapitated by Gilgamesh, and Gilgamesh uses his head for a potropea to, to ward off other demons. So he predates the Gorgon by a thousand years. So we start to see these monster snake things. We start to, it becomes clear where a lot of the monsters and beasties that we're talking about come from. And this is why. I mean, when, when you do um, history or classics, it's almost like you want to um, swipe the Google map just a bit <laughs> off the Mediterranean so that you can get this. Because on this side, you have Harappa. So from 2500 BC, these trade routes go through all the good places, up the Indus, Mohenjo-Daro, Harappa, um, Iranian Plateau, Ur, um, the Arabian uh, Peninsula, which actually had a lot less water in it at the beginning of that, um, Byblos, Greece, Egypt. Uh, we, like, the history of monsters is the history of commerce. Uh, and this is kind of where you start to get um, the most recognizable. This is like the origin of the dragons as we recognize them. Egypt's proto-dynastic period, much like Greece's, begins with this um, flowering of Near Eastern monstrous imports. You see that on particular palettes. It's m maybe difficult to make out there. But um, the monsters they get are all griffins and, and, and basically Near Eastern rather than Egyptian demons. But you expect that because urbanization is always preceded by the expansion of those commercial networks. That's how you build cities and wealth, by trading it with other cities uh, around your network. 
So I like, elites obtained novel sources of distinction and prestige. Boring, but essentially it's the same process you see in ancient Greece uh, at the time, but now several thousand years earlier. Uh, it becomes very interesting and very exciting to have foreign monsters. And you see on the Nama palette, um, humans are lassoing monsters uh, that had only appeared in Sumeria a few centuries earlier. So that's quite an indication of sustained contact. That wasn't a, a slow, gradual diffusion. Speaking of Sumeria, we move into part four. You get the same sort of layers of um, monsters all the way down. Well, these are gods, but um, Chaos Dragon at the top. Uh, Sumeria is the earliest written record of, um, I guess, what we would call a Eurasian um, time measurement. They measure time in aeons, uh, and you see that reflected in the gods and the fact that the, the myth cycle is stories of a beginning and ending of the world, usually with the destruction of the old one uh, and the building of the universe out of its corpse. And in the case of Sumeria, that corpse was a dragon. That was Tiamat. And that idea persists. So uh, we can see, I think, Marduk slaying Tiamat in, Tiamat in the top left. And that's kind of to make it look a bit more what it looks like. I didn't draw that, by the way. Thank you, internet. Uh, and even a few, a few centuries later, and a different being, you get uh, Mushushu. Uh, and it's a constellation Leo and Hydra. So you not only get the persistent iconography from the beginning of Sumeria, you also get a persistence of that astrotheology that the dragon represents or is from the stars. In the Enuma Elish, uh, you, so Tiamat, salty waters of chaos, um, merged with the sweet waters to create the sky and the earth. So that's that um, you have separation of sky and earth in Samaria as well. In several verses, she either turns into a dragon or generates cohorts of dragons, which is super awesome. Uh, Marduk grasps a herb to shield himself from her poison, sends an evil wind at her that she swallows, distends her stomach, and he shoots her open and builds creation from her corpse. So again, we're starting to see, like St. Margaret, um, that, that same typology of a dragon beast being swelled up. So St. Margaret, which is uh, an analog of St. George, is itself a typological version of this story. So we're starting to see the shape of the stories move now to 2500 BC. So we're, we're getting in deep. We can go deeper. Ninurta and Azag. No one's quite sure what Azag is, but it is very probably a dragon. The, uh, the texts are incomplete. Uh, it appears as the last sort of form of snake opponents for Ninurta, so this is proper early Sumerian stuff. It was a child of heaven and earth, so I think we can sort of put them maybe one, Azag one generation down from the separation creation story. The plants, this is really cool. The plants had declared him their king. So like uh, there's some kind of um, pharmaca association with plants and dragons and, and rulership going on here. You see that with Marduk um, protecting himself from poison with some kind of mystery plant. Uh, Azag is sometimes a tree but more often a serpent and then sends the sky after Ninurta in serpent form and that's obviously that could be comets, that could be a specific asterism but it's definitely an astrotheological story. So the Babylonians got their dragons from Samaria we need to ask where the Sumerians got their dragons from because they sit at the beginning of what V. Gordon Child would call civilization. The Tablet of Destinies, I don't know if anyone knows much about the Tablet of Destinies. It's along with the Holy Grail, like my favorite uh, mythological object. Uh, it's really weird uh, and it's all about, no one is quite sure what it does, but it's about power and the right to rule. So you see it in the Enuma Elish and, and a number of stories coming up. And there's, at the time, so the, the very earliest stories of Samaria, there's confusion over who owns this tablet um, and, uh, and stories of legitimate ownership. So it's first bestowed by Tiamat. So it's obviously something to do with that right to rule coming from the original dragon layer of creation. Marduk seizes it because he needed it for some stuff ordering the universe, uh, but then he gives it back to his grandfather. So the, the tablet has power if you possess it, but he, Marduk knows that it doesn't belong to him and it belongs to his grandfather, so it's this weird object that, that makes you control the universe. And, and the gods and the kings controlled the universe because it was a sort of stellar processional, uh, not processional in an astrological sense, but it was a stellar play out. Um, the gods fulfilled a function as did the kings in Samaria. So this is like the power plug. Uh, and you could right there see at the beginning of Samaria confusion over 
well, who gets this? What, what's going on? And that, I suspect, is a reflection of uh, incoming cultural impact um, from somewhere else, basically an invasion, cultural or otherwise. Because isolation is relative, everyone will tell you, well, if you've read books that are older than five years ago about Samaria, it's true, it's a language isolate, um, which is fine. But if you overlay the time distance, or if you overlay the beginnings of Samaria, where, depending on where you date that, you start to see the, what uh, happens is that we're missing half of it. The Flandrian transgression is um, when the water from the Arabian Gulf came back in after the end of the, it's sort of sloshed. Um, so it was much lower at the end of the Ice Age, went up, went back, came back again. So the last sort of death rattle of the end of the Ice Age was only about um, 4,000, 5,000 BC in the Arabian Gulf, just where we see these things show up. Uh, so we're missing half of it. I don't think it's that isolated at all. But the other thing is it's an isolate if you only look next door. It's related to what uh, is currently a hypothetical language, but shouldn't be, uh, Elamo Dravidic, uh, and it has dozens of Austronesian words. We're going to head to Austronesia in a sec, but technically before English, it was the language that had the widest distribution on planet Earth because it goes all the way from Madagascar uh, th along the south of India, Southeast Asia, out into the Pacific and to some parts of South America. Lands that appear mythical in Samaria at the beginning, like Dilmun, uh, they show up in early stories, but by the end, they're showing up as, as, as trading lists. They're like, oh, this stuff came from Dimul, and so many ships came from Dimul. Because you know what the Sumerians are like? They wrote everything down there. Very OCD. Um, so the places that they refer to that we think might be mythical can't be. Uh, they were real, and they were accessible. This I like. Guys, I'm going to have to explain to you at the back. This is uh, Y-DNA haplotype T. It's part of a... Um, a theory which I quite like, which is that there is a um, Afro-Dravidic connection. The Dravidian, uh, Dravidian culture, where it came from and where it went, is still weird. Uh, and we start to see uh, genetic links between places that were quite strong in it. Incidentally, for Egypt nerds, uh, odds on for punt is here. And the theosophists thought punt was India. And they may have both been right. Because that, I mean, we, we haven't found punt, obviously, uh, but you have a strong genetic association between India through here and the Horn of Africa. So there may well have been something there that looked Indian to the theosophists, but actually matched where the Egyptian or Egyptologists think they went. The linguistic relationships. So, Sumerian, Elamo Dravidic, Dravidic. Remember the separation of heaven and earth? You're starting to see that same shape um, from, the south, from Southeast Asia up into Europe. I just want to do one little thing about um, Vedic dating. Um, the current dating of it is arbitrary, and it's hugely, hugely political, so we won't go into it. Everyone inside India says 10,000 years old. Everyone outside says the opposite. Uh, it's, it's caught up in Indian nationalism and what have you. But I will say the, the dating for when it was written down is, is entirely arbitrary, especially as the system of uh, like memorizing it and repeating it is very, very old. So that kind of swings backwards and forwards. Uh, it may well, so technically this story may well be the oldest dragon story, but it's too political to say so. It's the same kind of idea though. Indra defeats Vritra, um, firstborn of the serpents, by dashing him to pieces with a thunderbolt. And that releases all the world's water um, that Vritra had dammed up with his body. The water rose to conceal his body parts. So again, you see a very similar type to Tiamat and the story of Tiamat there. It's about deluge, it's about dragons, it's about building pieces of the universe. Keep them in the back of your head. So at 4,000 BC, give or take, uh, we're going to stop digging briefly uh, because we kind of need to go into what it is we may have found. So we're going to talk about literalism. How does something become a myth? This is something we uh, potentially need to get over as a cultist, especially looking for one explanation for things. So, oh, it's just that. And this is as close as I could get. So, Magonia or extra dimensional phenomena interplay with tribal history, local landscape and skyscape, which includes the stars, uh, and a political environment. And you can pretty much start anywhere here and it will scoop up stuff as it goes. So, the dragon isn't. Um, just kingship, it isn't just the constellation Draco, uh, it isn't just a way of recording um, elite bloodlines histories, it's a mix of them. So the dragon exists the way democracy exists and Buddhism exists and potentially some other things. There's my lovely Dr. Jacques Vallée.
and this is from his most recent book, Wonders in the Sky. The accounts most closely resembling UFO crashes within the scope of our chronology come from the Chinese law and describe the fall of dragons. For example, dragons fighting in the sky in 1169 AD, um, pearls like carriage wheels fell down on the ground where they were found by herd boys. Another one, 4th century AD king um, saw a black dragon in the sky. Its glittering eyes illuminated the whole vicinity so that the huge monster was visible till it was enveloped by clouds which gathered from all sides. That's a very ufological event, um, seeing lights in the sky and then having it affect the local weather. The next morning, traces of its scales were seen over five miles until the rain washed them away. Glittering eyes illuminated the whole vicinity. Looks to me, well, in my head, because my head is weird, like the last 10 minutes of Close Encounters. But it also looks to me kind of like, remember when we said this, the origin of the word dragon, to see clearly or to glitter or sparkle? Um, I think maybe it gets its scales from phenomena like this. Oh, and I love this one. Let's get um, a cold for a bit. Athanasius Kirchhoff got a, um, a letter from a guy in Switzerland. I saw a very bright dragon uh, with flapping wings go from a cave in a great rock and a mount called Pilatus toward another cave known as Flu on the opposite side of Lake Lucerne. Its wings were agitated with much celerity, whatever that is. Its body was long as well as its tail and neck. And what's good about this letter is He's like, it's not a meteor. I know what a meteor is. This was a dragon. Uh, I'm, that's why I'm, I'm sending you this note. I am not a crazy person, but I saw a dragon. <laughs> uh, that's really nice. Um, this I write to you, your reverence, in case you should doubt that dragons truly exist in nature. I don't think he did. This is the kind of stuff Athanasius got up to, bless him. Um, dragons, all this kind of weird stuff. He's really cool. Uh, we should. He, for instance, thought he deciphered hieroglyphs. He got it completely wrong. But he got it wrong in a predictive way, so that there was, I forget where it was, there was a, a tipped over um, obelisk, and whilst his translation was wrong, he knew what was going to be written on the other side based on his system, so I have no idea. That would, that would be cool to play with. Kent, so let's get a bit more local. Um, 523 AD, still up in the sky. Dragons, lions, and other furious wild beasts fighting in the air. In the west of Kent, it rained wheat, and soon after, great drops of blood, upon which ensued extreme dearth. You don't say. Um, but that's that same lights and things fighting in, in the sky. And interestingly, that dates to, um, well, it's loosely contemporaneous with, say, Vortigern's Tower. So there's so a lot of space weather going on at the time that we uh, call dragons. We wouldn't call them that today if it happened today. Ah, dragons and shamans. So let's move from Magonia into druggy Magonia. Uh, 1960s anthropologist Michael Hanna spent years living in the Amazon. He was one of the sort of uh, ayahuasca anthropologist pioneers before it became kind of dickish and obvious to do that. Um, he encountered dragons on his trips, uh, giant reptilian entities um, that resided in the base of the brain where the skull met the spinal cord. Uh, they showed him, and I love this, this is quite cool, they showed him a prehistoric planet Earth and these dragons descending from space, these huge black blobs with tiny wings. And they said that they were fleeing an enemy from deep outer space and they had created the Earth so that they had somewhere to hide. And that they were the true rulers of the Earth and basically one day this bad thing is going to come and get us. And I'm like, well, that's, yeah, paging Mr. Reich. Uh, and so this is a weird thing to be told and so Michael, uh, well, Dr. Hanna, what have you, got a bit anxious about this, and he went and spoke to a local shaman and said, the, the dragons have told me that they run the earth, and there's this, they're the true lords of the earth. And the shaman's like, oh, they're always saying that. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's like, it's like your homophobic uncle at Christmas. It's like, oh, they're always saying that. <laughs> they're just the lords of the outer darkness, and I'm like, oh, fair enough. But I, I quite like that idea that they're, they're dicking with him. They're, they're obviously dicking with Ike as well. Uh, we get on to local girl, um, local girl, Dr. Serena. Um, demonic phenomena. Dragons are associated with um, what John Keel might call window areas. Uh, Offington is one of them. Um, it is definitely quite weird there. Uh, you have um, a whole bunch of other stuff in the, in the area, but that particular place is associated with ghosts and barrows and, and so on. You have dragons appearing at Winkley Castle in Devon in the 16th century, uh, and dragons appearing over barrows in the same sort of area. So you still have that kind of weird elite uh, and ghostly window area association, which brings it halfway back from 
um, drug. Sits that in between Dr. Jacques Vallée and um, the drug dragons. I love this. Um, Vikings left dragon graffiti inside Maze How. They broke into it in like the 8th century, maybe, no more, 9th century, uh, when they were looking for treasure. Obviously, there's no treasure. It's a, it's a you know, Neolithic site. But they left dragon graffiti inside, which I'm pretty sure is apotropaic because they were basically on their own kind of hobbit journey of some description. Speaking of, they don't tend to stay missing for long, um, dragons. Um, if you think about cultural change, either associated with elites or even in the 20th century, how um, the swings happen, you think of the 60s, you think of Dungeons and Dragons, and both of these things really spun culture off into directions that would be unimaginable. Uh, if, you, if you thought in the 50s that the biggest movies and, and games of the year would be to do with dragons and all, you know, and, and the occult and magic and all this, it would be uh, a pretty tough sell. Everyone knows Tolkien said this, I desired dragons with a profound desire. Um, of course, in my timid body, I did not wish to have them in the neighborhood. Of course not. Uh, but he actually, um, that was his most famous saying, but he gets pretty close to, um, to basically calling out the reality of a lot of the things that he writes about. Not Middle Earth, but the beings that he uses to create Middle Earth. So. Um, the dweller in the quiet and fertile plains may hear of the tormented hills and the unharvested sea and long for them in his heart. For the heart is hard, though the body be soft. So that's quite... Uh, he's basic, he, he went astral, essentially. This is, he had some kind of hyper-imaginative uh, process where these things became real. Uh, I, and this is, this is what I mean, like, a dragon is no idle fancy. Whatever may be his origins in fact or invention, the dragon in legend is a potent creation of man's imagination, richer in significance than his barrow uh, in his, than his barrow in his, is his gold. I must have done that wrong, whatever. So he's basically saying, don't, don't dismiss this, don't do the, um, I just made this up. There's something about this particular form that does things. So. What is a literal dragon? We've just sort of raced through weather phenomena, space um, weather phenomena, asterism, so that's star stuff, psychological artifacts, thank you Professor Tolkien, the neighbors, some kind of Magonian UFO connection, um, devices for conveying tribal identity, uh, and elite status symbols. And the thing is, because they're non-randomly distributed, cultures with dragons encounter dragons. Cultures without dragons don't encounter dragons. Um, by the way, that's, that's my grandfather showing a crocodile to the Duke of Edinburgh. So lizard meets lizard, I have a weird family. <laughs> um, this is sort of out of Africa genetic information. Don't, ignore most of it. Uh, the most interesting arc is we sort of went up and out pretty quickly, straight out of Africa. So we're going to sort of zoom in. We've gone down through here. We're going to go here because actually we go up and out and then from here we go up and here and here and over. So we're going to zoom in on this bit. Uh, Sunderland, obviously, at the time when people were first migrating into Southeast Asia, uh, there was much more land. In fact, twice the size of India went underwater at the end of the Ice Age. We learned here. I love this. Dr. Joanna Nichols has this really, it sounds, I'm going to talk you through it, but at a high level because it's, it gets quite nerdy. But there's a linguistic dating method based on language structure and like yes, no. Um, so does it have subject, object, verb? Uh, yes, no, and you can actually do, uh, you can trace languages back further than you can doing traditional linguistic methods because linguistic methods rely otherwise on loan words. So they have a horizon of about 5000 BC, which sounds like a lot of time until you want to start overlaying linguistics with very early population movements. And one of the things you find is that linguistic complexity decreases as cultural complexity increases, because that's an indication of an empire. Like, linguistic complexity decreased around the world with Rome, with the British Empire, what have you, because local languages were replaced by, other, well, you have less complexity because there are less languages. The first rise of cultural complexity she found, she started this information in the early 90s, um, occurred in Ireland, Southeast Asia, 30,000 to 20,000 years ago. So there was one linguistic event um, about 65,000 years ago in Africa. The next major uh, increase in cultural complexity happened in Ireland, Southeast Asia, 30 to 20,000 years ago. And this is the early 90s, so the Art of Africa project, everyone kind of assumed they were guessing at the dates, uh, but it's very, very interesting that we're now starting to see alignments of genetics and linguistic uh, and geological 
historical evidence. So circumpacific colonization happened from Sunderland up and around, so from sort of like New Guinea up the coast of Asia and then down into the Americas. Realistically, there was some, um, which I can't, well, I can't prove in this presentation, but there was some transoceanic stuff as well, but that's the, the major migration wave actually came up um, Asia rather than through it. Uh, that also happened westward, so Austronesian, as I said, the languages in this area stretch all the way to Madagascar. Words such as cinnamon and uh, actually lemon uh, appear at the very, very beginning like this uh, of Indus uh, cities. The, those words appeared in kind of Sanskrit and they're Austronesian. Uh, cinnamon is a basically New Guinean Southeast Asian word and there they are at the bottom of our first cities. Uh, specific genetic markers um, link back to the um, draconian cultures. We'll get onto that in a sec. And if you think about the Nagas, which is much, much later than Harappa, uh, they are an invading reptile people coming from the east. So there is some kind of east to west reptile correlation. This should look familiar. These are specific genetic links between the Austronesian homeland and Eurasia and the South Pacific. Turkey, UAE, India, South India particularly, and up um, through Asia and of course out into the Pacific where you, where literally here be dragons. This I find interesting, and it's just almost a little bit of an aside. The end of the Ice Age uh, coincides with what Dr. Oppenheimer called the Age of Crocodiles. And this is the first time since we left Africa that we had no choice but to share our food supply um, with a super predator. Lions and tigers are actually very easy to avoid. But if you're in the mangroves, if you're fishing in this kind of gray water, which all of it is, um, we were subject to predation at, at higher levels. And I find that quite compelling that that happened around the same time as we start to at least be able to prove um, depth of dragon mythology and also the spread of them up. And I'll show you why. This is cool, Isaiah, uh, so Leviathan, and he will slay the crocodile that is in the sea. Psalm 74, uh, thou didst crush the heads of the crocodiles by the waters, thou didst shatter the heads of Leviathan. So quite a few thousand years later, and yes, there are a few crocodiles in between New Guinea and uh, Israel, but if these stories if the story shape has tumbled down, and I think it has, this may well be um, quite interesting, especially as you take it up north, which we're going to do now. Heading north. This is from Marco Polo's um, diaries. Has anyone ever read them? They're amazing. He, he has this thing about fiat currency. Like the, the Chinese were using paper money, and he's like, this is insane. This will never catch on. It, it's only here because if the, no one accepts it, the king will kill them. This is ridiculous. We'll never do that. And well, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> He obviously encountered a crocodile, um, leaving the city of Yachi. Here are seen huge serpents, 10 paces in length and 10 spans in the girt of the body. Potentially exaggerating, but then we have um, the jaws are wide enough to swallow a man, the teeth are large and sharp, their whole appearance is so formidable that neither man nor any kind of animal can approach them without terror. Um, others are met with a smaller size being, uh, eight or six or five paces long. So he's, obviously he saw a dead, mangled, large crocodile in a marketplace somewhere and had this thing explained to him. Uh, in the daytime, he's got that wrong. Uh, by reasons of the great heat, they lurk in caverns. Whence at night, they issue out to seek their food uh, and they'll eat anything. Uh, after which they drag themselves towards some lake, uh, spring of water or river in order to drink. By their motion in this way along the shore and their vast weight, they make a deep impression as if a heavy beam has been drawn along the sands. And that's certainly what um, crocodile slipways look like if you've seen them somewhere like uh, Central Australia. You're, those are the bits to avoid if for some reason you're walking near where saltwater crocodiles slide. I wouldn't recommend it. Japan. The thing about Asian dragons, we think they fly without thinking about it, and they do, but the overwhelming majority of dragons, uh, oriental dragons, are associated with the water or deluge or underneath the water. If there's actually a dragon king palace uh, under the sea in Japan, and that's this guy, um, Ryujin's palace. Uh, Naga, interestingly, is one of the um, Japanese words for dragons, so you're almost starting to see, I think, uh, in the cultures surrounding Southeast Asia, an echo of an event, um, a, a memory of something that's happened that was then incorporated into local landscape and space weather and so on. 
Now we get to the earliest layer that we can find archaeologically. Um, Jing Longhua culture, probably, but definitely Hongshan um, pig dragons. And these were used as grave goods. These dates pretty much correlate with at least one of the um, cultural movements uh, up the coast from Southeast Asia. But it looks very aerobarous, doesn't it? It's got a pig head, sure. But that dragon is eating its damn tail. And that is 8,000 years ago. Well, uh, between six and 8,000 years ago. Which, comes, which means we come to, as I'm talking about the shape and typology of stories, um, there's a, uh, Harvard has an Indologist uh, called Dr. Witzel, and he has a book called The Origins of the World's Mythologies, which is amazing. Uh, and basically, Laurasian mythology, according to him, is 40,000 years old, then you have Gondwana as an earlier layer, and then he's got a hypothetical one called Pangaean. Laurasian mythology he calls our first novel, uh, and it's sort of a stretch from North Africa through Eurasia and into the Americas. Everything underneath it, Gondwana is like sub-Saharan Africa, potentially the bottom like Dravidic um, tip of India, PNG, uh, and Australia. Now the broad shape of this is, is probably correct. I think he's underestimating, and I'll come on to why, just how many pieces of Gondwana mythology emerged into Laurasian mythology, but once it's, once it's set, once it becomes this novel, uh, and he He's, he traces the movements of, I think, this Laurasian story, our story, um, very successfully around the world. And the Laurasian myth is the um, creation of the world um, to its destruction, so creation of Father Heaven, Mother Earth. You get those generations of monsters, that's the next bit. Heaven is pushed up, separation of sky and earth. Uh, killing of a dragon, the flood is punishment for hubris, and tricks to deities bring culture. So that's the shape that you find that he thinks was put together around 40,000 years ago based on what he called a forest of stories, which was the sort of local tribal um, spirit stories that you get from Gondwana. That's where you find it everywhere, by the way. So the razor is probably the earliest uh, we can date the dragon, but I'm not convinced that it is the origin of the dragon. It's definitely the origin of the dragon story. The fact that our Laurasian story more often than not begins with the destruction of a dragon does imply perhaps that it's, it's come from earlier. Now this is really interesting. I don't know, you may have seen this in the summer, but um, you'd be familiar with the rainbow serpent um, creating the earth with its movements, uh, the Aboriginal story. This summer the oldest religious ritual was discovered in Botswana. A 70,000 year old worship of a python who created the earth with her movements. So it's not a dragon, because I said specifically that we weren't going to talk about the snakes, but it may be her grandmother. Because if you think about that broad shape, just picture a world map in your head that Dr. Witzel was talking about, that would time quite well with the first linguistic complexity. Then you see the movement down to Australia, which was left alone until we found it, and I'm your fault, so sorry. Um, they still have this basic shape of the story, and then anything from uh, New Guinea up as a result of, say, the end of the Ice Age and, and uh, migration kind of moved the remaining bits of Gondwana story into Laurasia. So this is quite interesting, I think, that um, the dragon may well be the very, very beginning, or at least its grandmother may well be the very beginning of religious ritual on Earth. So let's go conclusion-wise. So, I hope we can show that we can use history to find the dragon, but more importantly, I think we can use the dragon to find history, because you can start to see how that calibrates where certain connections between cultures that have informed the Western mystery tradition come from. And I think of it like in 1966, the CIA dropped light bulbs of virus uh, into the uh, subway vents, and then tracked, it was about two million people that got sick, but they were able to do that. They did the same thing with paint, and I think uh, of dragons in that way, that they can, where they show up is an indication of some form of connection. So, and also, please, please take away, a dragon is not just one thing. Uh, I think magicians need to expand when we do these sort of explorations beyond a single explanation. We go, oh, it's that, on to the next thing. Uh, that's very unsatisfying when you're talking about things that are hugely complex and evidently hugely old, like a dragon. Uh, so we need to expand, but not so far that we lose sight of the subject completely, because most definitively, the dragon resists singular explanations, but it more fiercely resists being anything you want it to be. I think we need a little bit more discernment when we put these things together. That's its gift, though. Um, it, using the dragon as a yardstick, we can expand uh, sort of magical timelines beyond where we currently look at them and look for other connections between things that have 
inform the Western mystery tradition. And I think that even if it doesn't change your practice at all, uh, it leads to a grander and more fulfilling worldview. Uh, I kind of put this presentation together as a promise to the dragon. I did the whole office uh, ritual and a Welsh version of it at Dina Semris last year. And uh, knowing or participating in this research for the last few years really deepened that experience for me because the red dragon of Wales is definitely not a New Guinean crocodile. But it is part of that. It is part of that story, and, and it's so much more profound when you can um, pull those connections together. So, uh, thank you very much. Okay, so do we have some questions for Gordon on this subject? And which cultures don't have dragons, and what do they have instead? Good question. Um, the uh, dragon density is lower in um, sub-Saharan Africa, but they have, well, Botswana has snakes. So, oh, yeah, um, <laughs> dragon density is lower. They still have them in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and funnily enough, in um, North America, they don't have many dragons in North America. They have a few, it's sort of medium density in South America, obviously, you've got Quetzalcoatl and that kind of thing. Um, but those are the two places that don't have uh, much in the way of dragons at an early layer. Like there are places where um, later cultural imports have, have changed that slightly. Uh, and there's mm, probably medium density dragons. There's less dragons uh, as you go out into the Pacific as well. Sort of uh, Melanesia has some, but they also still have crocodiles. But by the time you get to Polynesia and Fiji, which only get crocodiles of a rate of about one every 10 years, obviously very lost and sick, uh, you don't get much in the way of dragons. Oh. <laughs> Can you say a bit? I saw you, you, you were in the crocodile as well and the history of migration from the Far East to... No, I think... No, I think... Um, uh, well, how did sorry, Well, that's a good question because... Um, we were talking about the dating, for instance, of when people were in uh, Egypt or the Nile Valley last night. Uh, there is a carving at Gobekli Tepe that is a crocodile, right? Um, that's 10,000 years ago. Turkey's not known for its crocodiles, so the memory of that has to have come from somewhere. There are closer crocodiles to Turkey than New Guinea, so it may well be a Nile crocodile. I merely mean that for some of the stories that informed Oriental um, dragons, I think some of them may have come from the fact that we had to deal with crocodiles in our food supply. Well, we, um, uh, these cultures had to deal with crocodiles in the food supply. I don't think necessarily the idea of a New Guinean crocodile went from the southeast to the northwest across the planet. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a huge popular series, Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. How do you interpret presence of the dragons in the new story? Uh, that's another presentation. It's a very good question. Uh, I would say the, the current resurgence of dragons in a particularly realpolitik uh, milieu, which is why everyone finds Game of Thrones so satisfying, other than the sexiness, is, um, is that it's like House of Cards. It is very satisfying to see uh, in that Aristotelian understanding of theatre, that, um, that politics is just real politics. It is a Game of Thrones. And I find, I find it mythically significant that the dragons are involved in that. Um, yeah, so I hope, I hope that answers it. I think that's what we're seeing. I think the dragons are here because of a widespread dissatisfaction with political process. Is there any evidence at all about what cultures there might be before the Ice Age? Yeah, there's loads. Um, if you, what you want to do, I mean, if you want to, uh, an informed speculation of the cosmology of people before the Ice Age, I would get Dr. Witzel's book, um, The Origin of World Mythologies, because he does a very, very good job. The Laurasian story um, is kind of mid-Ice Age, but his speculation of 
Pan Gaia. So at the end of the book, he puts it all together and say, okay, I think at a time depth of 200,000 years, this is maybe what our worldview was. Take that for what it is. He admits in the book, by the way, it's hugely ambitious, and he's going to be wrong, um, but he's throwing it out there because it's sort of, I think it's the biggest project in mythology since Campbell. It's, it's such a good book, and it will, time will not be very kind to individual pieces, but the macro idea is something we, we need to onboard into esotericism. And I know that the dragon or serpent is connected with menstruation, Chris Knight talks about. Yeah. Which is the original rainbow serpent. And I just kind of wonder about is there some of this subconscious, especially with the connection between the dragons and the past, which would have been a female preserved, you see the dragon, the idea of the petal. So I just kind of wonder in this story, is there also, as well as an astrotheological dimension, also a sort of a female menstrual dimension that's absent and strangely absent from the story? Yeah, well, I, I think the story, I think the reason we talking about Witzel's version of Gondwana was a, a forest of stories, Laurasia was our novel, I think someone who wanted to be king put that together. I think it was the idea, if you can describe the universe, you can run it. So to, to your point, the fact that um, Tiamat is female, uh, and so is the rainbow serpent in most tellings of the story, I do interpret I do think those, thing, those two things coincide, uh, really. I think we maybe lost um, a, an appreciation of female creation at that point. That seems to happen to us repeatedly over history. But yes, I, I think the Laurasian story is very much about kingship. And there are pieces that, there, particularly for women, I guess, I'm not one. Um, there is value in, in looking at it that way and even approaching things like the dragon that way as, as a recovery because quite, I think that is a, an import from Gondwana, from that earlier layer into Laurasia that needs to be unpacked in a, in a, in a better way. Yeah. Yeah. Five twenty-three AD. All right. Yeah. Um, but I, do they know what a lion like? Well, yeah. The lion is one of those monsters. Um, the reason we also have lions are so popular in heraldry is, like whales, they they were quite mythical. They, no one knew what these things were. They knew that they were in sort of brown parts of the world, scary and sometimes biblical parts of the world. So when people say a lion, it may not have looked like a lion, but it may be what they, they thought it was. I mean, Elizabeth I was given a narwhal horn and said it was a unicorn horn. I was told that, but how, how does she know? I mean, she didn't see much of the world and she had this great big freaking horn. So I agree, but when they say it was a lion, it could have been anything. And that's kind of to the point, which is whatever these phenomena are, we interpret them in an almost screen memory way. So cultures that have dragons will see dragons. Cultures that don't will see something else. It doesn't mean that the phenomena isn't real. It's sort of Jacques Vallée's macro uh, hypothesis. It's th in the interface with culture do these um, Magonian events take on the shape that um, we see them as. And I think the dragon is one of the mo deepest and most profound ways of having that kind of Magonian interface. Uh, so yeah. Yes. Uh, I um I recommend to anyone doing the whole office uh, in some sort of ritualized form. Uh, uh, you can find it on my blog. Um, just Google that. Uh, it's a uh, it's an ancient Greek dragon spell. It's basically uh, it's a, I don't I don't want to call it Kundalini, but it kind of is. It's sort of awakening um, dragon energy, uh, and I think there's tremendous merit in that. It's intense, uh, but I think there's tremendous merit in that. And the relationship between the magician and the dragon, I think, 
is uh, a kundalini and the whole office are versions of that where by encountering or absorbing or whatever it happens to be, you do take on uh, some of its power. And I think that power is very early creation stuff, which we were just talking about. I think there's quite a, quite a potent piece of tech there that becomes even more potent when you give it its historical context. So it's, this, it's like a five line uh, incantation, which you obviously repeat, but uh, that, knowing that potentially we're talking about a time depth of 70,000 years Botswana, means that this is something that's very powerful. And I think it's something maybe magicians should um, look into. Sweet, awesome questions. Oh, Sorry. cephalopod. Yeah. Um, okay, so Kamal then, 18th century, uh, dragon turns up, starts laying waste to town. Uh, French, probably some sort of nobility type chip, comes back and shoots it. Is that some sort of site for possibly like a, a nationalist insurrection? I think it is. I think it's probably more humble than that. I think it's uh, a older version of a story. I, th I bet you the guy, when he was uh, overseas at war, he was probably not lowborn doing so. I bet you the guy who allegedly shot the dragon was from a highborn family. I think it was local politics. I think by the time this story was recounted to this sort of Edwardian Englishman when he got to come out and show, um, it, he, they'd be able to point to the family that did it, and I bet you they live in a big house. So I think that's what the Carmarthen story is. I still think it's very sad. I just find that really sad that it just decayed in the river and, 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 <laughs> and washed out to sea. That's awful. But yeah, I wouldn't go as far as that. Um, although the dragon is historically associated with it. That's why I started with the, the flag incident in the 50s. This is, there's a local story that I read. Um, it's a 12, uh, 12 something, like 13th century. Buckley, which is just the next village along, um, the bishop had to be called out to uh, banish a dragon that was eating babies. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that's, I love that. <laughs> 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 yeah. it's, it's obviously like an actual thing, so it's not like a physical thing because the bishop had to banish it. But, I mean, had to well, what is it? Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, maybe not astral. I, I, why I like the word Magonian is that it covers a physical and non-physical event that is actually happening. I mean, we, we get alien abductions, less so now, because half of them were military-based, but we get alien abductions, and it's that same kind of fairy baby-stealing thing. A dragon eating babies is like a fairy stealing babies, or it's some kind of phenomena that we interpreted in this way. It also, I suspect, would be a power play for the bishop. Uh, again, like, look at me, I banish dragons. I'd like to be archbishop, please. Uh, and I'm sure, again, like the Carmarthen guy, the, the drag is always there when people are on the make. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we also have uh, another love dragon story, uh, Anna, where um, there's actually a spear on the wall in the church that is supposedly the spear that was used to kill the dragon. It's uh, like close to the local area. That's so really that, hobbit. That's suggestion of physicality about something. Yeah, like well, I, there are, I, in no point am I saying that the physical parts of a dragon are a New Guinean crocodile. Um, I, I think these phenomena can manifest physically. I mean, you saw in the, the story of China, it obviously dropped, whatever that weather phenomenon was, um, it dropped giant pearls. Uh, and so these things have a physicality to them. I don't, I wouldn't deny that. Um, at all, and I love the idea that there's a spear in the church. That's cool. Yeah. I think it's also worth giving out um, a nod to Ken Russell's very quiet world moment, which people haven't seen that probably. There we go. <laughs> Is there an association between dragons and earthworms? Mm, sure. And you know, George and the dragon. I heard one of the explanations and hypotheses that is that is the church conquering the pagan communities. And the yeah, any uh, it could be because St. George is the sort of one of the more popular patron saints. He's patron saint of about 30 places like Catalonia, different parts of Syria, and places where peasants are revolting as they inevitably are. Uh, so yes, that may well be certainly part of it and I think it would, especially if you're talking about Germanics, uh, it would typologically say to them, um, I'm, I'm here to stomp you. Uh, because if they have a positive association with the dragon, which incidentally, Europe had an ambivalent association with the dragon rather than positive before Christianity, then it sort of became negative. In the East, you have a positive one moving up, and I think there's an opportunity to sort of date where that bifurcation happened. Uh, but yes, I, I think in that case, I think St. George was used because he was a Roman soldier, and the Normans thought they were replacement Romans, as does everyone who has an empire. Uh, 
He was a Norman soldier who killed a dragon. That is just ready-made for um, stomping on pagan peasants. Mark again. Although, since you're, I should actually tell us what's an Egyptian saint, not the same. And, uh, so there's a line source, there's the origin of the image of this soldier saint, right, George? But then that's Horus. So there's Horus versus Set in, in the in early Coptic iconography. But it's, it's the Roman soldier versus the dragon. And then you go back in, before the Christian stuff, and it's, it's Horus versus Set. You go back a little bit further, and it's actually. Set versus the dragon. So it's. That's cool. I don't know if it's. Hmm. Uh, that is political, but it's so, surely maybe this to you is order versus chaos. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, no, that's. I mean, so the, I mean, it's. Right? Yeah. It's more freaky animals that live outside civilization. They represent chaos that needs to be put into order by religious orders. So, and then there's a religious cosmic aspect in the. I think, yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm talking about how the dragon or St. George is used. Um, it, that is, that is what it means when it, you get into that sort of, um, that period that it is order versus chaos. But I, I would say that's political because it, um, order inevitably comes from having a king and a church. How convenient. Um, so, yeah, but I think it's a good point. Um, St. George, there's a, another extra layer which is worth, particularly for people of a more goetic bent, looking at um, St. George, which is, he didn't exist like most saints, like most of the people. He never physically existed because he's a type, as um, Mog just said. You get versions of that story elsewhere. But what happened around the time was um, where his church is now, or where, where his like quote unquote burial place is in Syria. It's actually it's obviously the mound. It was originally called the mound of like some kind of highborn warrior. So people were leaving offerings at the tomb of a dead warrior who wasn't Saint George, uh, and that got absorbed into the Saint George myth. So there's some kind of dead king warrior aspect to it, like an actual legit ghost that uh, is, is worth um, playing with. So we have like some sort of Syrian ghost warrior saint fighting a dragon. It's actually quite cool when you describe it that way. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the um, dragon getting bloated and bloated and then getting pissed and then water's turning up. How, what's the correlation? How, how well does that overlay with um, sudden flood myths? Um, that seems like some, you know, well, yeah, no, the, the flood myth thing is my area. Um, some of them do, um, not that many of them. I mean, inevitably, there was flooding before the end of the Ice Age. Um, I do think in a lot of cases you can trace uh, a memory of the end of the Ice Age in through mythology. But it, every time you see a flood, it's not the end of the Ice Age, and um, sometimes it is. But in a lot of the dragon cases, I think we may make the reasonable assumption based on the spread of them in Laurasia and the fact that the beginning of this Laurasian mythology starts at 20,000 years ago. I think it happened, and the flood happened whatever it was, 12,000 years ago. So yeah, I think the, a lot of those stories predate it. I think it's more to do with how the universe is created out of the body of something older. Or the skull in uh, in Polynesia, um, in particular, you get uh, it's it's very hermetic, which is one of the ways I think it's quite interesting that we end up like the mind of God or an interpretation of consciousness. Um, it's the skull of uh, or the whole body, and, and the skull becomes the stars. So it's like the mind cosmos connection in a, in a tribal sense, and I think that's the angle with what Tiamat and all those sort of dragon types that the universe is built out of is. I think it's a description of reality.